Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, good morning. We are back. It's good to see you, Scott. How, how are things? Zoom, golly, golly, golly. That's what we're doing. <laughs> we're doing Zoom. Yeah, Zoom. since the last time we, we chatted, we've had a presidential election, a state election, you know, uh, a rise in COVID epidemic. All those things have happened, but uh, my life continues to go on, my life story. Part I think three. we're... I think we're up to the part where the Cro-Magnon men and the Homo sapiens were fighting for the control of the cave. I think that's the part of history that we are uh, we've, we're ready to cover. Oh, you, you, I know, I know that's what you're going to cover. So let's do this. Uh, we have been talking to Arnie and, t- and his life story. We have done it in our first two parts. You can find them on our app in our uh, podcast section if you haven't heard them, so you can go back and listen to them. And now we'll do part three, where we'll pick up Arnie's the last chapter. part. Let's say this is a, this is the third part of this uh, of a this mini series in the last the last episode. The last episode, but surely not the least episode. This is actually the most exciting episode. As far as I'm concerned, because this is when I met Arnie. Right. And uh, all right, when we come back after these words, part three or final episode of Arnie Sherman. Back after this. Kids make choices whether to drink or not. Bye, Dad. Remember, I'm going to Alex's party tonight and sleeping over. Hey, uh, remind me about that party again. And adults make choices whether to talk about it. That's true of parents and every other trusted adult in a kid's life. Kids want to know our expectations, and they want honest answers in everyday conversations. So talk with your kids and help lead them on a positive path. Because when you talk, they hear you. Learn more at underagedrinking.samsa.gov. Arnie, we are back. Now, yes, we are. Arnie, just to refresh the recollection of our audience, uh, yes. the gentleman was born uh, in the New York area, uh, in the uh, in the early days, I'm not going to tell you how old he is, but he. I'm uh, so old that when I went to school, they didn't teach history. <laughs> but but you know, story- there are a lot of a lot of reminiscence and stories that I think the listeners, uh, at least the ones that have uh, reached out to me, find uh, you know interesting. Everybody's life is story. interesting. Yes. He has a, you have a fascinating story, but you went from New York to Cincinnati to Chicago to D.C., and now we're going to talk about your international travel. Yes. I think, I think uh, what I would like to share with the, our listeners is that uh, in the late 90s, I had the opportunity to start working in a part of the world that few Americans outside of the U.S. Embassy had any experience with, and that's the former Soviet Union which is now 15 countries. It's divided up after, after 1991 when Boris Yeltsin uh, democratized uh, the country. It, it uh, broke up into 15 separate countries, Russia being the largest. But I had a chance to start traveling there and working there, representing um, uh, U.S. and global companies that were trying to enter the market and visited all every republic, went to every, uh, you know, uh, the far reaches of the former Soviet Union, which was the largest you know, country in the world at that time in terms of landmass, uh, 11 time zones um, uh, across uh, the Soviet Union, and uh, had many, many interesting experiences, worked with uh, uh, people who are now oligarchs, you know, had experience working with uh, uh, Russian prime ministers, uh, um, worked with Vladimir Putin, had a chance to meet Vladimir Putin and have some interaction with him. What year? Well... I was there from, I I was started, I started going there in 93, doing leadership development work, started doing business work there in 97, and -hmm. then opened a full-time office there in 90, and stayed there, Uh, I spent 200 days a year in the former Soviet Union, and in some surrounding areas like China, Poland, Eastern Europe, from 90 to 97, Mm -hmm. I probably spent over a thousand days in that part of the world, um, and then, uh, and then uh, came to Montana from there. Arnie, what was it like doing business there? Like, you know, as an American, how do how did you do business there? How hard was it? It was it was hard for a number of reasons. One, they had no experience in in uh, 
doing business on any kind of uh, a Western basis. You know, it was a central command economy. You were doing business always uh, with the government. You know, the government funded agencies. They took all their profits. So if you ran a if you ran a, a, a copper mine in the Soviet Union, you got your operating budget from the government and a separate agency sold your product and the money went back into the government's coffers. So there was no um, sense of, uh, of a, a normal, you know, um, buyer-seller kind of relationship. So they had very little experience. I put the first Western... TV commercials on Russian television. They had no idea how that worked and how you know how it was set up. Uh, they never had any paid commercial advertising. And wow. I put the I put the first ads. I, I I wrote them, produced them, edited them, and then sold them to the three stations. There was a Moscow station, a Russian station, and a Soviet Union station. And I sold the first uh, TV spots on the Russian media. And they had no idea. They basically asked me what to do, how it worked, what was the right price to charge. One of the things I learned from that experience is, is it's, it's all based doing global business, doing business outside of the United States in particular, since our society is so legally and transactionally oriented. Most of the rest of the world operates on relationships. And over the time that I was there, I built enough relationships in enough places with enough people that uh, I had a good reputation and uh, and people you know basically trusted what I said and how I you know handled myself. I never bribed anybody. I never you know tried to manipulate anybody. I was representing big companies. I was representing the largest U.S. shipping company, the largest U.S. Ho hospitality company. I was doing work for Fairchild Aircraft and and um, and Sandia National Laboratories, a nuclear laboratory. I was working with some very large companies, so people you know, respected uh, who I was and who my people were. I had 16 people in the office in Moscow that were doing this kind of work. But after that period of time, it was it was like the Wild West. I mean, really, it was, it was you know, we negotiated for seats on airplanes. Every airplane, for example, was completely sold out forever. People would buy tickets and sleep at the airport for three or four days, and they would load them on planes like buses. Mm. But if you were a foreigner and had hard currency... At that time, the ruble wasn't uh, a currency that you could exchange with any other currencies. They wanted they wanted foreign currency. They wanted the U.S. dollar, and so you'd show up at the airport and go up to a flight that was, you know, that you wanted to get on and pay with U.S. dollars. And guy e, which are which is Russian for police, would take you on the plane after it was full, and then you they'd ask you where you want to sit, and you'd point to somebody, and they'd take them off the plane, <laughs> and you'd get the seat. And while that sounds horrible, that was the only way you could fly. If you're trying to do business, did you feel safe trapped, flying? Yeah, what? Did you yeah. feel safe? Well, it wasn't always safe. Uh, one time, the co the pilot and the co-pilot got locked out of the cockpit and had to use an axe to break their way back in. It happened one at one time on one of the flights that we were on. I had equipment fall off of planes. I landed at airports where there were. Um, wreckage surrounding the runway. That was the only way you could see the runway. There's so many wrecked planes. We once paid uh, a pilot 200 U.S. dollars to land the plane where he was supposed to because they decided, since there were only two people on the flight that wanted to land in uh, Sverdlovsk, um, Ekaterinburg now it's called, we had to pay 200 bucks in the middle of the night. He landed at the airport, dropped us off. It was below zero. We had to actually break a window to get into the airport or we would have froze to death. So we had all those kinds of experiences, you know, and looking back, it sounds like very adventuresome. But during the time it was happening, it was it was very uh, daunting. You weren't you sure what happened. Uns, did you ever feel unsafe doing business there? Did you ever feel like, you know... I only had one, one experience. I got a phone call at my office from uh, the Russian... Uh, it was called the, the Russian um, Organization of Entrepreneurs and Industrialists. And uh, it was, the, the conversation was in Russian. One of our staff took the call, and they said, a Russian, famous Russian general wants to meet you tomorrow at 4 o'clock. He's sending somebody over to take, take you to the meeting. And I said, well, what does he want to meet about? They said, I don't know, but when a Russian general asks you to meet, you meet. So this guy puts me, we go, we go on, get on a train, we go four stops out of Moscow. It's already dark. Mm. We walk down the hallway in this dingy train station. He literally takes out this big key ring of big 
skeleton keys and puts it into this gray metal door and opens the door and turns on a single light bulb <laughs> and, to, and motions me to walk down the stairwell down this dark stairwell that goes underneath the train station. You know, and I said, and I, I, at that point in time, I, I actually thought about bolting. But I said, you know, it's a Russian general. If he wants me, he's going to get me. I can't leave the country if, you know, he's, you know, if he wants he's after you. to find me, if he's after me. So we go down the, the stairwell, and there's another door, and put a key in and open it up. And we walk in, turn the light on, and there's a whole table. It's about 30 feet long, covered with uh, hors d'oeuvres, or as they call in Russian, zakuska. And I figured to myself, they weren't going to cater an execution, right? They weren't going <laughs> to. So I felt a little relieved. And then we walked by the table into another room, and the guy with me, who was my escort, said, Take all your clothes off. I've, wow. I've never been to a meeting where anybody had ever asked for that, and uh, handed me a towel. And then we went into another room that was, it was a big banya, a big uh, a ceramic tub, and there were three people in the tub. And uh, one of them was the general, one was an interpreter, one was his, his aide. And I got in the tub and, you know, started asking me whether I was interested in buying basically Russian military equipment. <laughs> you know, because he knew I represented a, transportation, represented a transportation company. So that was a very unsettling experience. You know, but I generally didn't, you know, I yeah, had... Anyway, before you leave that, that experience, yeah. so... How did the experience end? I mean, uh, first of all, it was food and a hot tub, and that yeah. was the meeting. Well, I said to him, um, initially he wanted to know if we wanted to buy an Anatov 225, which is the largest cargo plane in the world. And uh, I said, well, look, we're, my, the company I represent is a shipping company. They have ships. They're not in the air business, but they certainly have colleagues and friends. So if you give me more specifics, I'm happy to go back and talk to my yes. client to find out whether they have any interest in this. And actually, he said at the time, so you have you have ships. Would you like to buy submarine? <laughs> and I said, well, I, we're not really in the submarine business, but I'd be happy you know, to chat with them. What, what I realized later on is the government had, had cut off the budgets for all of these agencies basically even the military there was uh -huh. no money for them and so they were out trying to figure out how to make you know make their payroll how to get resources how and they were they you know they, they thought they could sell off some equipment later on a couple of years later i read that they actually sold the russian military actually sold some submarines to the clubrian drug cartel to bring cocaine from south america you know to other you know to north america so they actually found a buyer for but but one of my clients were interested in not a, a bad way to transport, or, right? Or, not a bad way to transport. No, so contraband. Um, Arnie, did you? Um, I mean, I'm curious when you, when you say you didn't. That was the only time you maybe felt unsafe. Who would you be able to commiserate with and talk to uh, when things like this happened? Was there someone else there that kind of was your confidant? Either? Well, I had I had. Um, senior staff that worked there. I had eight Americans and eight, eight Russians that were in, that were on the organization. Mm. Um, we, one of the things we did because we needed to have insight into um, what was happening, you know, from a, from a Russian Soviet perspective, we hired one of the highest ranking uh, deputy directors of the ministry of transportation to come work for us. Mm. And so we had uh, a seasoned a guy in his late forties who had spent twenty-five year career working in the ministry, who you know knew his way around and knew where. Not what you needed to have is not to not only know where the minefields were, but where the mines in the minefield were. We could figure out where the danger areas were, but we mm. didn't know where the specific hot spots were. And by having somebody like Sergey. On the staff, he would tell you, you know, here's somebody you can talk with. Here's somebody you don't want to get involved with. And I'm right. sure he had his own biases, but by and large, his advice turned out to be very good advice. So it's, what's that incredible? So from the Wild East to the Wild West, how yeah. about, by the way, 20 years later, 25 years later, you see some of the things that they're currently doing. Does any of it surprise you? I'm surprised he's been there that long. That they've that the Putin has maintained power that long. It's a tough place, you know. There's a there are pigs at the trough and pigs trying to get to the trough, mm. and it's it's surprising that 
one of the pigs trying to get to the trough haven't made it there yet. They'd rather have cut their deals with, uh, with uh, Putin than to try to uh, go against him. You know, he's a tough guy to go against. He was a KGB operative, and uh, right. some people say that uh, the Ru Soviet, well, Russia is run by the KGB, and Putin is just chairman of the board. <laughs> That's how they look at it. So, so, so take us back to 1996, 97, right? When I came to, when I, when I arrived in uh, Montana. So Actually, it was 1995. I was asked to come to the uh, Montana to speak at the University of Montana on a, on a conference they were having about working in, you know, newly emerging markets. And I turned them down, actually, initially, because I was burnt out. I was tired. I, I was, uh, these trips were exhausting. I'd go over there for 10 days, you know, uh, uh, at night, at 11 o'clock at night in Moscow, it was only 5 o'clock on the uh, p.m. on the East Coast. We used to work. We used to get going to work at ten o'clock and wait, work till 11, ten in the morning and work till eleven at night every day, communicating with clients and doing business back with the United States. So it was really, it was draining. I couldn't do it now for sure. Right. And I turned. I didn't want to travel. I didn't want to get on another plane. I didn't want to come to Montana. But a good a friend of mine, Dayton Duncan, who had just finished working with Ken Burns on the Lewis and Clark uh, show for PBS. I happened to be talking to him. He said, well, I just came back from Montana. We shot the opening scenes of, uh, of the Lewis and Clark in Missoula. Missoula is a great town. You ought to go. So I called back and said, uh, my schedule will change, and could I, I'd come out. And I'd only been to Montana one other time. And uh, came out and uh, spoke on a Friday. And on Saturday, I went into a real estate office to kind of get a real estate guide because folks back east were interested, you know, a river runs through it and all that kind Perfect. of Stuff was percolating around. They were interested in Montana, so I went into a real estate office. And to make a long story short, at five o'clock that day, I made an offer on a house in Stevensville, and it was accepted. And I had a uh, what I thought was would be a vacation home in uh, on Sunset Bench in, in uh, down in Stevensville. Incredible. And Linda, your wife at this point was not with you on this trip. No. Did you, uh, you and, but did the two of you come to Missoula? Didn't you? We've been there once before. We had come, we had come on a trip and gone from Bozeman. Looked around Montana. We were I very see. interested. Uh, it was interesting because it, I had met James Lee Burke, who uh, at a bookstore, at mystery bookstore in Washington D.C., and he had written at that point a, a few novels, and some of them they were taking place in, um, in both. Uh, Missoula, Montana, part of the novels had a Missoula uh, a presence, and the other part were taking place in Louisiana. Mm. Um, and uh, we decided uh, just on a whim, let's go to let's go to Louisiana and vi visit the, the places that he made so vivid in his novels, um, and then let's go to Montana. And so we did that on two trips. So we'd been here once before, but when I got on the plane, I had not planned to buy a place right, in Montana. Buy a house. And so I, I had it and was visiting it off and on for two years, and I let all my friends and relatives know they could come and stay. And 88 people over the course of two years came and stayed wow. at my place in Stevensville. And then I had an opportunity. I, I, after I spoke at the university, Larry Guy and Cheddar, the dean of the business school, said, if you're ever back, yeah, I'd love you to come to talk to students about some of your experiences. So I came back a couple of times and didn't call him because I was only in for a holiday weekend or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then I called him and, and came over and and uh, talked to some of the students. And uh, in uh, in uh, sort of early '97, uh, he uh, he invited me back and we had a meeting with the governor and the president of the university and some others about helping to build a World Trade Center at the University of Montana and teach at the business school. And and honestly, I really wasn't ready. To do that, but I said to myself, you know, Montana seems to be a great place, and if I there's not would, there would not be many jobs in Montana that would be of interest to me. This is before technology and sure. you know distance work, you know, was really uh, in vogue. I said, you know, if I don't do this, somebody else is going to do it, and probably it won't be available for 17 years. And so I did it, and, and I turned out to be the person who did it for 17 years. <laughs> I truthfully, when I started, didn't I never I'd never lived or worked or stayed any place that long, but technology changed and and the university was very good about letting me continue to do some consulting work, like many faculty do with some of my larger clients. So I still had a a bigger 
picture feel to things and help set up the World Trade Center and teach at the business school, uh, you know, teach about international business and trade. Did you so enjoy it, teaching? Did you enjoy the teaching aspect? I like teaching. Yeah, I like teaching a lot. And I, I usually taught one, sometimes two classes a semester and uh, limited the class to 36 students and it was always full uh, each semester. And it's funny now that after, uh, you know, 20 or you know, 23 years, Many of the students that I had early on now are executives themselves, and it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a rewarding and uh, and uh, surreal experience to remember in your mind a student sitting in class in in 2000 who's now CEO of a company, incredible, you know, and remembering them in class, and many of them, many of the students from the early days and even up until when I taught uh, at the end, I think the last year I taught at the university was in 2013. Um, they stay in touch and uh, and uh, ask for uh, advice occasionally and you know tell me what they're doing and you know with all the social media uh, platforms uh, you know I have I, I'm probably connected or networked to uh, you know well over a hundred of the students that I had during uh, my time teaching. Sure, and you and I know this because we've talked about this. You have a, an extensive network through the University of, of your students that have gone. Right, to, I say. taught I taught over. Uh, 1,100 students during that time, and I had probably uh, over 100 interns during that period of time that worked. We always had two or three interns every semester, and I, I was fortunate I could pick the cream of the crop, so to speak, because you know I'd see them in class and see how they handled class. And class for me was not; it was more like training than academics. I viewed my classes. You know, I was still working. I was still interacting around the world with businesses, and I brought the my con contemporaneous work experience into the classroom and tried to organize, organize it more like I was training people for international work. Is that and many of my students ended up ha have ended up uh, with international business careers. With that, do you think do you think that's why your your classes, other than your of course your stellar teaching and your personality, winning personality, do you feel like that was the reason why? Your, student, your classes were always full because it was a very practical. Well, the of word of mouth got around that it was kind of cool and hip and, you know, they, right. they, lots of stories. And, you know, story, I'm surprised. Uh, I ran into one, one of my students uh, recently who, who was uh, one of the early students from like 2000. So that's 20 years ago. Mm. And they, rem they don't remember much about the class, but they, 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 they say, I remember those two stories. Mm, you know, and, story, right. and I'm happy they remember the stories because the stories were always illustrative of some experience. It capsulized some experience and, and had a message to it. You know, like a story like uh, with the Russian general, you know, in the hot tub. There's a message to that story. Sure. Right. There's a message. Do you feel like, you know, now that you look back, because you just said 20 years ago, um, do you think this was inevitable that, you know, when we told your story, we talked, we always, you've always been heading west, right? Right from the get-go, you started to head west. And you, yeah, I made a couple of deep going to Russia. Actually, but, I, other than going to Russia, but, but the thing is this, is that you've always, do you feel like traveling and experiencing new cultures, new, new people is always kind of the thing that has always piqued your interest and kept you going? I didn't really, my first real international non personal not vacation trip didn't happen till uh, you know I was in my 30s but oh, the first trip was so eye-opening to me and was such a rush compared to other things I had done because I early part of my career was in children and youth work and running right. you know public interest agencies and and uh, I went to a a global conference and it was a it was a very tense interaction between the the US delegation and the Soviet delegation at that time and uh, there was a lot of political intrigue and overtones to it and there were delegations from uh, over a hundred countries at this conference mm. and I realized how little I knew about the rest of the world and I felt that I needed to know more mm -hmm. I mean this is you know, forgetting what your discipline is, what your area of experience is, is, there are 200 countries in the world, and at that point I had been to about three or four. And mm, I realized okay. this whole vast um, 
universe out there, world out there, that I have very little understanding, knowledge of, or contact with, and I felt it was important to, to me personally to explore and learn more from that. I just thought it was an enriching experience and for my life. I also yeah. think you. I also think that just in looking at, at your travels and your and your stops along the way, you've kind of always done it without fear, right? You've always just thrown yourself into a situation and adapted. And not that's not for everybody. No, it's not. And I, I was speaking to a class um, yesterday uh, on the internet. Seventy Italian students at the University Cattolica University in Milan. Mm. And I was I was uh, I was speaking to a class. I was doing a presentation about working around the world and cross-cultural negotiation and those sorts of things. And, um, you know, a couple of people asked what, you know, what motivated you to do this? What, what were you afraid? You know, and, and really, my, you know, guiding principle always for me being an optimist was what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, and I felt like in most situations I could, you know, handle the worst thing that could happen. When I was first asked to go to the Soviet Union for a large company, that was going to pay me to go there, my initial reaction was, I'm not the right guy. I have never been there before. You know, mm -hmm. I've been on there on a, a trade mission, but I've never gone to do business. You know, I'm not a businessman. I'm a, you know, I'm a not-for-profit agency administrator, you know, but most of my career. But then I sort of said to myself, nobody else is doing, has done it either in this particular place. And I do have some contacts, and I understand contacts are more important than understanding uh, the content of a business or an industry. I'll never forget that. That was one of the good lessons. When I was working for uh, Sealand Shipping, which was part of CSX, the largest U.S. railroad, and they asked me to go over and do some work for them, and I ended up consulting with them for nine years, ten years almost. They said to me, we don't care that you don't know anything about our industry. Mm -hmm. We can teach you everything you need to know in about two weeks. So we don't care you know that. What you have that we need is you have market knowledge. You know how to you know to enter the market. You know who you can figure out who we ought to be working with. You can figure out the lay of the land. You right. can get us intelligence and information. That's more important to us than you being a salesman for our products and services. And I shared that with you know, with the, I've always shared that with students that that's really important to learn the lay of the land and and you know over the years I picked up you know, helpful, you know, hints and uh, and uh, ways of doing that, that uh, and building a, a global network that even in countries I've never been to, if someone calls me, I, I've never been to uh, uh, several countries in Central Africa, for example. Mm -hmm. You can right. pick up, you know, Somalia. I've never been to Somalia. If someone said to me, I need a reputable distributor in Somalia, can you get me a two or three names I could make two or three phone calls or send two or three emails and I can get names that I would, you know, um, value, that I would say, you know, based on my reputation, based on my experience, these are people worth talking to. And that's, you know, but that takes a long time to do. You can't do that, you know, in two years. You this has been a 25, 30-year journey to be able to build all of that. So, and then secondly, to answer, you know, sort of the other part of the question is, um, I'm not really an explorer in the sense that I want to go into the jungle, you know, with a backpack and uh, and live among, uh, you know, a tribe somewhere. But I've always felt that if there was an opportunity out there, um, if I was given an opportunity to do something different that seemed interesting, I would I would try it. I would do it work wise. Sure. You know, so and, open. Uh, yeah, I was open to your know, career change. You've made career changes, too, that, are, you know, that are that have shaped you know you ended up in montana doing something different than you were doing before and it was something that fit it you know you just you weighed the pros and cons and you said this sounds interesting exciting i'd like to go there there's other re and and sure i haven't done it before but i think i can do it What's i have confidence in my ability to do it well i also know that what guides your your spirit and your desire to uh try new things is your love of food your love of art you know, film, art, and, and music. Um, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that because that's something I suppose certainly in these last, you know, eight years that I've known you, that seems to define what you do with your with your free time, right? When you have free time. Yes. Travel. Um, well, I didn't do much of it when I was young. 
my family was working class. Um, I never, as a kid, never went to a muse, you know, art museums. I didn't know much about that. I never in my high school or college career ever took an art class. Right. I, you know, I didn't, I, I felt like my understanding of the arts was very stunted. Even through my 30s, I didn't pay much attention to it. I didn't know what was, you know, what was good or what was bad. I knew what aesthetically I liked, but it wasn't based on anything. I couldn't look and tell you the difference between an Andy Warhol, you know, or a Rembrandt or, you know, I just, I couldn't tell you when, when I heard a song, whether it was, you know, Bach or Chopin or Beethoven. I didn't know any of that stuff. And I felt not that I wanted to be a snob about it, you know, not to, you know, walk away from, I was the first person in my family that went, that graduated college. You know, we were working class family, but I felt I needed to broaden my worldly knowledge and understanding because, you know, it's sort of the gestalt of your life. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I thought the more I learned about things that were alien to me, the more I understood these, these parts of life that um, I didn't know about, um, the more I could be useful as a human being, as a uh, as a successful business person, advancing your career, you just can't be narrow. And you you know they talk about stay in your lane. That, that's a stupid way to look at the world. Just stay in your lane. I don't want to stay in my lane. I don't even know what my lane is. I right. want to be in every lane, you know, right. and then know what they all are, and then figure out at any given point which is the best lane to be in. You know, we're not, I'm not the same person. I don't have the same interest now that I had when I was 25. I don't, you know, I may be able to listen to some of the same, you know, but uh, um, so I, I, I purposely went out of my way to, you know, start going in when I was in New York to the Museum of Modern Art. I always liked theater. Theater to me was always uh, um, a great uh, uh, a great escape, and it was also uh, uh, an expanding, help expand your mind. One of the good things about growing up, and you had this in uh, in Jersey, but but in East Coast, New York public school education, every day you got the New York Times. Right. You read the New York Times as a, as a school kid. And then once a year the, in the public school, they would take you to Connecticut to the Shakespeare Festival, and you would see a Shakespeare play. Mm -hmm, yeah. And at first I thought that was, you know, a torture. I'd rather listen to the Yankees, you know, <laughs> than go to a Shakespearean play. But over time, I I developed a great fondness for it, and probably I've seen Hamlet now thirty times live, and and uh, you know, with some of the greatest actors that have ever lived. And that's been a you know to see the same character interpreted by thirty different people is a fascinating experience. Sure. And you can, and 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 it adds to other things in your life. It's not just to be a you know, a Shakespeare snob or say, you know, I, I'm not saying it to, to get a pat on the back. I'm saying because that's a, a learning experience that just adds to the repertoire of other things that, you know, you can appreciate, you know, Willie Mays making a catch in that field or Wayne Gretzky scoring, you know, goal, or, you know, Tom Brady, you know, winning six Super Bowls. You can also appreciate a character played, an, a, you know, a character like Hamlet played by, Benedict Cumberbatch or Richard Burton or, I mean, a whole bunch of different people's right. interpretation of the same thing was, was well, interesting about, to me. It's, well, it's about universal stories to your, the, to your prior. Right. Book. These are all you stories know, and these are certainly Shakespeare. And live music, you know, and live performances, as you know, um, a, a record, a, you know, a CD, uh, a, a digital recording cannot do justice to, a, you know, I mean, can't compare to a live performance. Right. And, uh, you know, try to do that. I mean, that's one of the things you and I, I think both are most disheartened about during the COVID. There's no live music to go listen to. You can't go to a concert. You can't go to a Broadway show. Watching Hamilton, you know, digitally on the Disney Channel is great, but it's not the same as sitting in the theater watching it. Sure. You yeah. know, you're part of it in that sense when you do that. There's nothing like being live and in person. Right. I mean, you know, well, you know, and, and, and seeing the same person or actor or a performer do you know the same part over and over in different ways i mean you know lou reed never sang this the same song the same way every time you know right. and uh it's interesting to see how you know 
the human condition is influenced by, you know, your own internal experience and, and also what's going on around you. How do you feel that living in Montana has influenced your worldview? Well, I know this is sort of hard to believe, but I've mellowed a lot from the way I was. <laughs> sure. You know, I came here and I said, well, I, you know, I didn't have quite the attitude, these country bumpkins, and I'm going to teach them a lesson. But I said, well, I can get things done a lot faster, and, you know, I can, you know, what they're planning to do for the next year, I can do it in a month. You know, and then uh, a couple of people, you know, kind of put their arm around me and said, slow down. You right. know, you don't have to, you know, it's like feeling groovy. Slow down, you move too fast, it's tired, you know, you got to make the morning last. They helped create a sense of balance, that work isn't everything. Right. That you don't live and die, you know, based on, uh, you know, your productivity. It's not that it wasn't important, but there were other things that were important as well. And so I think the Montana experience helped with that. I mean, certainly, even though I lived in Stevensville and had a 30-mile commute each way every day, it was not like being on the Long Island Expressway <laughs> or the uh, – five in LA. I mean, I could, you know, I could be on my phone talking. I mean, it was, it was not, you know, it was not one of those crippling experiences. Michael Harry, who was on our show, used to come in his early, for about 30 years of his life, he commuted an hour and 45 minutes each way every day, five days a week to work. I mean, that's crazy. Right. I mean, that's like driving to Butte, like living in Missoula and working in Butte every day for 30 years. Oh gosh! You know, it's it's it takes its toll. It 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 affects your relationship with your family and and your friends and you know some balance in life. So I think being in Montana, plus the people here are great people in Montana. Yeah. You know, build all kinds of relationships, friendships, acquaintances. I mean, you only have a few close friends in in your life, right? Uh, if you're lucky, but you have lots of acquaintances who you know who pay attention and care and uh, you know are willing to be good neighbors. Like in the old-fashioned definition of neighbor. Right, 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 right. You brought you said something to me very wise once. I forget when it was. We, you and I were both being asked to do something by a person I don't need to name, and <laughs> you said to me, "You go. This is the reason I moved to Montana. I don't want to be bothered with this type of stuff." And I right. always I always say that to myself. I'm like you know what, give yourself, you don't have to do everything. And if you don't want to do something, this is why you live in Montana. We want to do what we want to do, you know. Well, things that seem consequential to other people right. you know, in places like New York or Chicago or, you know, the big cities are not as constant, you know, they're inconsequential here. Yes. You know, in, in a way, and that's healthier. Yeah. You know, and, uh, uh, you know, if you miss this event or if you, you know, if you let your staff off early, I never, in the entire time I ran the World Trade Center, you know, involved in global development services, I never had a staff person ask me, can I have a day off? And I ever said no. Right. And what's the purpose? Right. Yeah. What's the purpose of doing that? Just to show you can say no? You know, if, if, they have the, if they have fortitude to come and ask, can I have tomorrow off? There's probably a reason they want it off. They why, you know, why say no just to show you can? I agree with you. I agree with you. Know, I hope my staff's not listening to this, but no, I agree with you. <laughs> well, you know, your management style, you know, at, uh, at Town Square is, is very much like that. You want to be a people person. Right. It doesn't mean you're being taken advantage of. It's just that you understand human nature. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's, you know in, in a place like New York, you might have said, hey, get the hell out of my office. You need to work <laughs> more. <laughs> you know? I mean, you'd be a wise guy. There's a lot less wise guy stuff here. And I think our listeners uh, would understand what, what that's like. You know, it's not like being in a Seinfeld episode every day, right? You don't have that kind of intensity. Uh, and that doesn't make anything here bad or worse. or di It's just different, and it's a healthier. I think it's a healthier uh, way to live. I, I, I'm, I'm in 100% agreement with you. I know that you like to travel a lot, too. You and Linda like to, you know, experience different cult different places, and I know that COVID is for many slowed slowed you down there. Yes. But once the once we have a, a vaccine and we have uh, you know hopefully knock on wood all you know all systems go, um, where do you want to go to next? You know that where you, that you can't do right now. Well, as I approach the prime of my life, you know I'm 
I'm not so much interested at this point personally in exploring new places. I've been over 100 countries. Sure. And I want to go back to the places that I have fondness for. Okay. You know? So what domestic. Are- well, you know where it's uh, domestically New York, right? Right. Got to go to. Got to go back to New York and. You know, we were t- I was talking about going back to New York, you know, around Christmas. And I said, well, you know, if the theater is no- theater is not going, if sports, if you can't go to the garden, if you can't go to the restaurants, why go back to New York now? You know, they, so, and that's the reason to go to New York, not just because I'm, you know, from there. It's, you know, it's, it's right. because of all of those things that uh, you appreciate about a big city and you know a global city like New York, you can go see a Broadway show. You can go to a sporting event. You can go to a live concert. You can go to an art museum. You can go to different ethnic restaurants or restaurants that you've enjoyed your whole life. So New York is one of those places. For me, uh, uh, Paris has always been an interesting city to me. I never get tired of it. No one could ever say, "Let's go to Paris," and I'd say, "Ah, I don't want to go there again." The architecture, the history. The uh, the food, the um, mm. you know, it, it's just it's just uh, to New York. It's a second city to me to New York. I in agree. Terms of of uh, the the feeling that it gets, it's 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 you know, again, it's one of those whole is greater than the sum of the parts. People say the French aren't nice to Americans. I never had that experience. I've been there twenty times. Right. You know, I've never had anybody say, "Oh, you're an American. Get the hell out of here," or be snooty about it. They, I, if you're snooty or you know or you act like the ugly American, you know, ye- you know, yelling in English, thinking that speaking louder is going to have them understand your English, you know, if you lo- if you learn thirty words of French, you know, and are you know and and are courteous, you know, people are going to be the same way back to you. Agreed. Another place like that, I like Italy, I like Spain, I like France. Um, so Europe, and, and those are the places you know I would travel to. You know, in in, uh, in cold weather here. Uh, it's intriguing to think about going to, uh, you know, a warm, a warm destination. But I'm more of a Europhile. I've been a lot of time in, some time in Africa, a lot of time in, a-, a lot of time in Asia, reasonable amount of time in South America. I just am drawn more to Europe, sure. and European experiences. And and uh, you know, it's easier to get around. And there's a lot of reasons. You know, there's a lot of heritage. Uh, my ancestral roots are there, in a way. And so that somehow plays into. I think some kind of part of my DNA that I feel, you know, in New York where I was born and in Europe where my you know ancestors came from that I feel some sense of of belonging in a weird way. Of course. No, I think traveling around around and going to certain places, a lot of t- times I've been to places where I said, Hey, this is a lot like Missoula, Montana. This is a lot like New Jersey. Whereas there's only one Paris, right? There's right. only one Rome. I mean, people say, well, you know, um, Buenos Aires is the, is the Paris of Latin America. No, it's not. <laughs> it has boulevards, but it doesn't. there's nothing about it that reminds me of Paris. There are places that remind me of Missoula. Mizzou- Mizzou- Ironically enough, we have a sister city, Palmerston North, in New Zealand, uh-huh. and I've been there. And it's very much like Missoula. It looks like Missoula. It feels like Missoula. The plain circles the mountains and lands like it does in Missoula. You know, so there are places like that. And I enjoyed, you know, going there. I like going to Cape Town, South Africa. The cultural mix there and the energy in Cape Town was very interesting to me. Sure. It was a good learning experience. You know, life is life is where, at this point in my life, it's life experiences like that that have meaning at, at this point. As long as, you know, I'm getting older, I'm still, you know, fully mobile. I can go in anywhere and do anything. And uh, um, that's what I like doing. Sure. You know, along and- with playing golf. I mean, you know, I have, I have normal, you know, normal everyday interests like everyone else. And I will, you know, I watch, watch movies that everybody likes to watch. And uh, I get enjoyment out of, uh, you know, well, the same things everybody gets enjoyment out of. It, but I have a maybe a little bit. Uh, longer view of it, you know, based on, uh, you know, living a longer life and living a, uh, a more, uh, you know, not a more, but in, for me, an enriched life from where I came from. I have relatives that I grew up with that I admired that have n- that live within 10 miles of where they were born. They haven't been outside of their bubble. No, 
you know, they've made, they've taken a couple of trips down to the Caribbean, you know. But I mean, their whole life is very limited, and I think you know people like that too. You know, why go anywhere else? New York's the greatest city. Or I had a friend in Chicago who I took uh, out to Seattle once, and he had never been outside of Illinois. You know, and he's a professional, you know, person. He's you know, college graduate, professional person, hasn't traveled very much. Mm. I had many students at the University of Montana who were Montana students who had never been outside the United States for sure, you know, at that point. And many of them had not traveled much at all, to, even outside of Montana. They hadn't been out of the state, I'm sure. No. Let's let's yeah. do this. Let's um let's go to our next break, our final break. Our conversation, my conversation is with my co-pilot here, Arnie Sherman. Uh, talking about his story, his life story, and we've kind of done this over the last three uh, shows. When we come back, we're going to have some final words and advice from Arnie for our listeners. Back after this. Buongiorno. Police Chief Jason White on a fatal police shooting. The initial responding officer approached the front door of the residence. The officer knocked on the door and announced police. When the front door was opened, the officer was immediately confronted by Mr. Brown, who was armed with a knife. The officer ordered him to drop the knife, which he refused to do. Montana Morning Weekdays, 6 to 8.30 on News Talk Radio 1290, KGVO AM, 98.3 FM, and the KGVO app. All right, we are back with our guest, Arnie Sherman. I just want to say for our listeners, I am not in ill health. (laughs) I am not getting ready to pass over to the next world. Um, this was a, a unique opportunity, and I want to thank Scott for for doing this because, uh, you know, it, it, while while I didn't want to do it initially, I, f- I found it you know a uh, good experience for me to talk about all this in a, in a way. And Scott's questions have been great and and brought back a lot of memories that I have not thought about in a long time. I'm generally pretty forward thinking, and instead of looking through the rearview mirror, I'm always looking where I'm going to go next. Usually, the answer to the question of where's the best place, where's, where's your favorite place you've ever been? My answer is wherever I'm going next. So that's been my attitude about things. So I'm in perfect health for my age. Yes, I can assure you he is. I play golf with him frequently and I see him walking everywhere. So he, yes. So Arnie, on the spot, you know, COVID has kept us at home and kept us, you know, hunkered down. I know you love con- movies, content, entertainment. Give me your top three uh programs shows that you've consumed over the last couple of months that you would recommend for our audience and tell me why well uh, i uh the trial of the chicago seven the uh you know the aaron sorkin uh, movie what with channel? sasha baron cone and eddie redman because many people don't remember that period of time it's been a long time ago it was in right. 1968 and uh uh those people were con- contemporaneous you know were contemporaneously involved in that when I was going to college and and it's remarkable to look back and uh, and uh, see that so that was that's one what thing that's streaming on what's that streaming on I think it's on Netflix pretty sure okay. it's on Netflix how about your second well if you want a complete escape if you're like bored and and you know depressed and whatever you should watch Borat part two <laughs> you know, if, if you like a little bit of outrageous stuff it's outrageous but it has a lot of social commentary to it that uh, that you would find I think find interesting particularly if you are more of a you know on the democratic side of things although it they, they poke fun in every direction he's a he's a genius in that way he makes you feel uncomfortable in the same way that Andy Kaufman used to make you feel uncomfortable but it's 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 worth getting uncomfortable to to experience it so i i found that to be to be interesting i i would agree with that and then thirdly the reruns of the sopranos for anybody who haven't seen that i mean it's one of <laughs> it's one of the greatest if not the greatest uh you know series that was ever done on television that mad men to me you know if i was if i was sent to an island, des- desert island and said you only have two shows to watch or three shows i take seinfeld just because it makes you laugh all the time i take right. sopranos and i take mad men it was so all, the acting and the stories and the human the human condition that they you know represented were were uh, well well done. I mean, just fantastic. Great writing. Yes, at, at the heart of everything. Yes, and don't ask me what three records I would take because that's almost impossible to pick the three record albums that you would recommend. You know, in, in, a, in our final minute, 
you are also you also have a very successful podcast on MTPR on Montana Public Radio. Talk a little right. bit about that. Well, this on my fourth season. We started off. It's called Can Do, and it was originally lessons for uh, uh, you know. It was basically uh, lessons uh, from savvy Montana business entrepreneurs. This year, because of COVID, it was blindingly obvious we couldn't ignore it. So we sort of pivoted, to use the current vernacular, to uh, focus uh, on uh, can-do essential business lessons. And we're talking about all different aspects of business uh, and how COVID has influenced it and what the future may look like. So your future- favorite guest? Who's your favorite guest? I'll put you on the spot. My favorite guest? Um, I haven't had the, my favorite guest yet. I like all my guests. They're they're all interesting. They're all terrific. I've learned things from every one of them. I mean, it's great being the host because you can ask the questions you think your audience wants to hear, but you also ask the questions you want answers to. Yes. So in all that time, the, the, if I singled one person out, I'd miss a whole bunch of others. It wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair. And on that note, we will we will say goodbye and au revoir. Uh, Thank you au so au much, Scott. And. Uh, I'm going to be returning the favor in future weeks as we talk about uh, Scott Richmond and <laughs> how my co-host got all the way from uh, Hoboken, like New Jersey to uh, Missoula, Montana. Well, I'll look forward to that one. Anyway, Arnie, let's get together next week with a new fresh guest. Yes, absolutely. There's a lot to talk about. All right. Speak to you next week. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. My name is Corey.